Bible now, and we'll start at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, even though we're going to be in Exodus tonight. But I want to start at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, and you'll see that in just a moment. We'll get there in a bit. Now we're following the Lamb of God as He walks through the generations of human history, uh, predestined to die upon a cross, just outside the gates of the old city of Jerusalem. You could still see the hill called Golgotha there, and uh, it's where they crucified everybody. It was not on the hill. It was not far away. I hate to ruin that good old song. It was down on the Roman road where everybody could see it, and they left the uh, prisoners to die, the, crucifix the ones being crucified to die on that cross. Now, living on the historical side of this biblical prophecy, though, we know the identity of that lamb as Jesus Christ, the one about whom we just sang, who was our Savior, and therefore you need to begin to respect him as your Lord. The name Jesus, or as the Hebrews pronounce it, Yeshua, or Yahshua, means my Savior. The name Christ, or as the Greeks pronounce it, Christos, means Messiah, or the Anointed One. Therefore the name Jesus and his title, Christ, is inseparable. He was God's promise to the patriarchs. Jesus Christ was God's promise, the fulfillment of God's promise to the patriarchs. Jesus was God's hope to the Gentiles. And Jesus is the soon-coming deliverer and blessed redeemer of all true born-again believers. So you kind of have to get into the language of the Bible in order to stand, understand all these different uh, concepts of the same person of Jesus Christ. He's more than what we think he is because he's in, you cannot define him and you can't limit him to one definition. You'll see that tonight. So even though the Lamb of God did not become flesh and dwell among us as a man or die on the cross until 4,000 years later from what we're going to see here tonight, after the fall of man in Genesis, God's elect, those whom spiritual eyes God chose to open, saw illustrations of him, they saw examples of him, they saw types of him, and uh, they believed in him, even endured reproach and persecution because of their faith in him, yet they continued to look forward to him. So those in the Old Testament are saved by looking forward to the one who would come. We are saved by our faith in the one who has come. So all of us are saved by grace through place, through faith, in Christ alone, is the gift of God, not as a result of our works, lest any man boast. But they, they were saved looking forward, and we're saved looking backward. Now you have on your study guide tonight the Westminster Confession of Faith. One paragraph out of that, I, I, I'm sorry, most Baptists and probably all of Southern Baptists have never heard of the Westminster Confession of Faith, even though that is the foundation faith upon which our statement of faith is based. But here in the Westminster Confession of Faith explains just what I said. Read it aloud with me, if you will. Ready? Although the work of redemption was not actually wrought by Christ till after his incarnation, the virtue, efficacy, and benefits thereof were communicated unto the elect of all ages successively from the beginning of the world in and by those promises, types, and sacrifices wherein he was revealed and signified to be the seed of the woman which should bruise the serpent's head and the lamb slain from the beginning of the world being yesterday and today the same and forever. That's chapter 8 and uh, there you can see it from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Let me encourage you, go online and just put, type it in, Westminster Confession of Faith and bring it up, and it will show you the history, the background, the depth of all the doctrines of that which we read in the Creed every Sunday morning. Now our journey began in Genesis as God told Adam and Eve that their disobedience to his word would bring forth death, both physical death and spiritual death. That judgment became reality the very moment they sinned and fell short of the glory of God, they began to die. And, and the very moment that a child is born, it also begins to die. There arose a separation between them and God. There was a spiritual separation, and everybody's born separated from God. That judgment manifested itself as death entered their home, and for the first time ever in the history of man, a father and a mother stood by the graveside of their child, and they wondered what was beyond the grave. 
Nobody had ever seen death before, but Adam and Eve stood there at the grave of their son, and they had to wonder, is there anything beyond this? That sentence of death continued from generation to generation until God saw that the wickedness of man was so great and it was unlimited that he decided to cleanse the earth through a worldwide flood. But even the flood waters could not cleanse man's soul or change his heart. So that judgment of death continued to the end of Genesis where we read, Joseph died and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And that's where we get basically the Christian understanding of burial. Now in that same conversation, God also told the serpent that in due time one would come from the seed of the woman who would crush his head and redeem those who'd followed him into sin. Now that began a spiritual conflict between God and Satan that would be manifested in and through the lives of human beings for generations, and that's exactly the conflict that you and I entered into when we accepted Christ as our Savior and Lord. The serpent would always be snipping at the heels of the lamb, trying to destroy that seed before he could accomplish his mission to give his life as a ransom for our sin. And then, but God would always be protecting that seed, preserving that seed until the time was right, Galatians 4.4, 4, for the sending of his son, God of every God, yet in the flesh, man of every man, to physically die as a payment for the sins of the world. I've said a lot already tonight that many people don't get, but God has all, had, all this was planned out before the foundations of the world. We're just simply following through on what he has ordained to happen day by day, year by year, and epoch by epoch of time. There's a great book in my library that defines this. And one of these days, maybe if I live long enough, we'll be able to preach the progress of redemption. You're going to see some of it tonight in this, but I would love to have time to do that. But God was always protecting that seed, and he will continue to do that today. Now, in our last sermon, the seed had been entrusted to one of the tribe of Judah. Judah was Jacob's fourth son by his first wife, Leah. In God's sovereignty... Jacob passed over uh, Judah's oldest brother, and he placed the scepter of leadership and authority uh, what would become the, uh, to what would become the nation of Israel in his hands, and he received the kingly blessing. So you can see God's process of election already here in the way he's choosing one and eliminating the other. We'll see that again in a moment. He also received the, lar the largest allotment of land of what would be called the promised land, the land God promised in a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then with Judah. Judah was the lineage through which the seed of the Savior would come, would be handed down to the next generation, and to the next, and the next, until he was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. So that, um, that seed in Abraham's, lineage, and Abraham's loin became that holy thing in Mary's womb, and that connects the Old Testament with the New. And so closes the book of Genesis. So, Look up here just for a second. Genesis is the book of beginnings. It's the record of the beginning of creation, the world, the heavens, the earth, and man, the very crown of creation. But as we've seen, it's also the beginning of death, as man re reaped the results of his sin and his disobedience to God. There was the obvious physical death, as the length of man's physical life was limited then to a maximum of 120 years, of course, they still leave, uh, lived 800, 700, 500, 600, all the way down. But as the, as the time went on, the length of life began to decrease. There was an emotional death. Uh, as envy and jealousy manifested itself in hatred and murder within marriages, within families, within communities, between nations, there was a psychological death as the dreams and desires of life were shattered by defeat and failure. So sin began to take its toll. What started out as everlasting life ended up being temporal death or, or eternal death. But more importantly, there was spiritual death as men felt separated from God. Something Adam and Eve, I, I, I just sometimes want to think about how wonderful it would have been to have walked in the garden in the cool of the day with God the Father and just have a casual conversation with the Holy God. And then to realize that because of my sin, there was no more casual conversation between me and the Holy God. Could you feel that separation there? Listen to me, that is the separation that's caused by our sin. When we sin, that shadow comes over between us, and we just don't feel that intimacy with him that we had before until we get that right through the daily confession of our sins and the repentance of those sins. So while his compliance to the sacrificial system gave him 
temporary blessings of idiots, the slaughter of another innocent animal every morning and another innocent animal every night. Uh, it, just didn't, it just didn't produce the oneness of God that they'd had before. Can you imagine that? Aren't you glad tonight that we don't have to slaughter an animal every morning and every night as a sacrifice unto a holy God? What they did not know was that every innocent lamb that was slain was a type. It was a picture. It was an example. It was an illustration of the Lamb of God who would one day come and take away the sin of the world. That was the book then of Genesis. And that set the pattern for the rest of the Bible. But the second book of the Bible is called Exodus. And in Hebrew, Exodus means these are the names, meaning these are the names of those who, were, who went to Egypt with Jacob, and all those names we're not going to read it tonight in Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. In English, Exodus means going out or the way out. You might see the exit sign on these two doors. That's what it means. It means the way out, like an exit sign. The overriding theme of the book of Exodus is redemption. Redemption, and I hope you're praying tonight because you're going to see a picture that I'm going to see the light bulbs just pop right over your head in just a few minutes. You're, oh, I never thought about that. Oh, is that what that meant? You're going to get that tonight. We're going to get a lot of aha moments in this Bible study tonight. So the book of Exodus is an illustration of God's plan for our redemption, for the redemption of those whose names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. As you saw the names written there in Exodus 1.1, Okay, our names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. And just as God sent Moses to redeem those who went to, ex to, went, went to Egypt, God is redeeming us who have gone to the wicked world. Look, Genesis ends with all mankind, the very crown of his creation, having fallen short of the glory of God. Exodus begins with God in his mercy running to save his beloved children, doing everything he can to redeem his children from Egypt, to show them the way out of their slavery, of to sin, and the way back into that intimacy with the Holy God. And you ought to have goosebumps on your goosebumps right now. That a loving, holy, majestic God would go to that initiative, to go to that, that, that limit to bring us back into intimacy with Him. We can walk around for days and not be concerned about that intimacy. God the Father doesn't like it when we're not at one with Him. Why? Because His Son made the atonement possible, the at one possible. Now, as we study this story in detail, we may not see how these events could possibly be expressions of a loving God to His people. But as we begin to understand why God did these things in this way, <clears throat> uh, and what He was trying to communicate to them, and to all those who would read about it in His Word, we can better understand what He did, and we can better understand what He's doing today in the world for us, because when He brings this redemption to an end. Secondly, we will be able to better understand the ways He's at work in our own lives, and then we can learn to trust Him even more. Why? Because we see what He did here, we can understand what He's doing now. With your Bibles open there to 1 Corinthians 10, 1-11, Let's read this together. I'll read it aloud if you read it um, softly and there uh, privately or in your own reading. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, notice in your Bible that's a capital R on rock, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the extent that, or the intent that, we should not lust after evil things, as they also did, and do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. Now, nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell, or they were killed. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages, not the world, the end of the ages has come. Now even secular history suggest these events happen as just as the Bible records them, but uh, God ordained them as an illustration of His plan for
for the redemption of lost man. How a Savior would come to free lost man from his bondage to sin, deliver him through his trials, even the outright attacks upon Satan that he brings upon us, and preserve us, provide for us, protect us, and sustain us until that day we are again at one with him. We can be at one with him tonight in the spirit, but there will be a come a time when we will be at one with him in the flesh, and we look forward to that day. There, that's why the Apostle Paul ended the passage in 1 Corinthians 10 with this word. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. If you want to write that down as 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, maybe something you ought to memorize. Why? Because when you get that information we're talking about this morning, when that information comes in and it's tempting, or that opportunity presents itself and it's tempting, you might want to quote 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Okay, Lord, I'm being tempted right now. Where's the way of escape? Where is the way out? And that's what you need to know. So as a book, Exodus is to the Old Testament what the Gospels are to the New Testament. They tell the story of God's plan for our redemption. It's totally of God. I want you to get this tonight. You're going to see this perhaps from a different perspective. It's totally of God. Israel was helpless. Israel was helpless. They could only cry out unto God for deliverance. They could not do anything about it. They couldn't change a thing. It's through a person. Moses is to Exodus what Jesus is to the Gospels. Moses became the deliverer. Jesus became our Savior. It's through the blood of a lamb. The blood of that innocent lamb that was placed on the doorpost was a picture of the blood of the lamb of God that flowed from Calvary's cross. And it's by the power of God alone. We're talking about salvation here. As God delivered the Hebrews as they went down into the parted waters of the Red Sea, so will he deliver those who follow him in believer's baptism. And most of us have never heard that connection before with the Red Sea, but you'll see it in the second hour of the sermon tonight. I want us to look at the book of Exodus from three perspectives. Number one, the purpose, the people, and the pictures. And God willing, we'll look at each one uh, in detail in the future sermons. Look at, first of all, the purpose. Just going to give you the highlights. Now, as we said, the introduction, the entire book could be summed up in one word, and that is redemption, or the way out of where you are. It begins with God's people in the darkness of slavery in Egypt, and it ends with God's people living in the victory and oneness with God in the promised land. It begins with God's people crying out for God because they feel like they've been abandoned by God. It ends with God coming down to dwell in the midst of his people and restoring that unity. He made himself present in the Shekinah glory. He made himself present in the tabernacle. He made himself present in the cloud and in the fire and the, and the water and the bread. In Exodus 15, 13, in the Song of Moses, Moses recognized God's mighty power to save. Exodus 15, 13 says this, In thy loving kindness thou hast led the people whom thou hast redeemed. In thy strength thou hast guided them to this holy habitation. It's all of God. It's all of God. God demonstrated the power in several ways, but I want to look at two of them tonight. Number one, in Exodus 11 we read about that final plague where God said all the firstborn in the land of Egypt would die in one night, but the Hebrews would be spared. Now we've covered this several times in several ways in previous sermons. But in verse 7 he says, But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, that you may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Can you imagine that? He says, a dog won't even, a dog does his, his tongue like that all the time. But he said, this night the dog will not even move his tongue to show the difference between the way God treated Israel and Egypt. Exodus 14, we read about the miracle where God parted the waters of the Red Sea. Verse 22 and 30, 22, 23, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand, a wall unto them on their right hand, and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them. All right, verse 28, 29. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all of the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Verse 29. But the children of Israel walked on dry land. Now, there are those intellectual theologians who do not believe this was a miracle. They say this is just a biblical exaggeration of what really happened. The Hebrews didn't walk across the Red Sea because that would have been impossible. 
Uh, actually, they say it was the Reed Sea, uh, which is a marshland just a few miles north upstream. Well, okay, there are two things about that. Number one, the Bible says it was the Red Sea, and I'm going to take God at his word that it was the Red Sea because it was the Red Sea. Second, if it was the Reed Sea, which it wasn't, you still have a miracle. I can see the three million Hebrews walking across the marshland, but how do you explain the whole Egyptian army and their horses and their chariots drowning in a few inches of muddy water? I mean, if the whole Egyptian army was drowned in the Red Sea, how can they drown in three inches of muddy water? So you still have a miracle. The book of Exodus illustrates and demonstrates the mighty power of God to save those who trust in him. In Genesis, God demonstrated the great doctrine of election. Now, some of you have a problem with this, so pay attention tonight. How he chose Shem from the three sons of Noah to be the channel of, God, of the godly seed. How he chose Abraham to father the nation called Israel. There was nothing about Abraham that would have caused God to call him. It was God's choice. How he rejected Ishmael as a man's efforts to provide a savior, but rather he chose Isaac to be the channel of God's amazing grace. How he passed by Esau and chose Jacob. And then from Jacob's <clears throat> 12 sons, he allowed Joseph to go down to Egypt to prepare a place for his people to survive the coming famine, but he chose Judah to carry on the godly seed. This is just God's sovereign election. As Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, we should always give thanks unto God because God has chosen us from the beginning for salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit. But as you turn the page to the book of Exodus, you see how God elects. So we see that God does elect, but how does he do it? Well, that's the doctrine of redemption. That's all through the book of Exodus. God himself providing a way out for his people. And God has provided our way out uh, of the sentence of death. He's provided a way out of our sin, a way out of our suffering. In the, and, and by the way, in the book of Leviticus, we see the reason God redeemed us is that we might worship him. So in Genesis, you have his provision. And in Exodus, you have his, his redemption. And for what purpose have, been, have we been redeemed? That we might worship him. Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. That's the way the Bible was set up. In the book of Numbers, we will see that our redemption and our worship of God will not be without warfare. And we talked about that this morning. That spiritual battle between God and Satan erupts in our hearts, and we have to deal with that battle every day. For while Satan cannot keep us from being saved, once we are saved, he will keep us, he'll try to keep us from living and believing like the chosen children of God that we are, and so we cannot be witnesses to others. That's why he puts a sock in our mouth. He doesn't want us to share the goodness of God with anybody else. Now, some of you are kind of going through the spiritual battle right now. I know that. Your body is here, but your mind is on other things. Maybe what you're going to have for supper tonight. Uh, maybe the devil has captivated your spirit so that you're not hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying. Oh, you're listening to me, and you're hearing every word I'm saying, but you're, and you're paying attention to what I'm preaching, but you're not listening to the Holy Spirit because you're not yielding your, your heart unto his leadership. You're not willing to obey his promptings, and therefore you're not going to be any closer to the Lord when you leave here tonight than you were when you came in. You have to hear beyond what I'm saying, beyond the sacred page, the song says, speak to me, Lord, that way, and, and God speaks through his word. So you need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you and then obey what he says to you tonight without hesitation. You know what God wants you to do. You know in your heart what you should do, but there's that little whisper in your ear that little voice calling you that you need to do something else. You don't need to do that. You need to do this, that, and the other. You need to think about what you need, what, all your plans for this week, what you got to do, get your calendar out, and so forth. No, nope. I'm telling you, that's a spiritual warfare of the believer, and only you can fight that. He'll give you the power to do it, but you have to do the fighting. But the good news is, if the warfare is there, here's the good news now, if the warfare is there, in other words, you want to do right, but you still do what is wrong, uh, that spiritual battle confirms your salvation. Because, hear me, if the bad news is, if the warfare is not there, if you have no interest at all in spiritual things, you're just going through the motions to please your parents or to set a good example for somebody else, and you really are not interested in what anybody's saying plus God, then that confirms your lack of salvation. And I'm telling you, my friend, you need to get your heart right with the Lord because it's just about sundown. We could very well see the rapture of the church before the end of the Feast of Trumpets because we're not at the end of it yet. 
And so we need to be ready for that call. Now before we move on, there's one more thing I want you to see about the purpose of the book of Exodus. Exodus is the second book of the Bible, right? So the number two, as we said this morning, is what is the number of division or difference. One is unity, two is division. On the second day of creation, <clears throat> God divided the waters from dry land, and he later established two lights. In the book of Exodus, God brought division between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. Uh, Pharaoh commanded the Hebrew midwives to allow the girl babies to live, but the male babies to die. Again, the parting of the dividing of the Red Sea into two walls of water. The Ten Commandments were written on two stone tablets. The Second Commandment prohibits worship of any graven image. In theology, the number two represents God the Son, and uh, who is illustrated here in the life and ministry of Moses. Uh, Exodus offers two options, trust God and be delivered, disobey God and die. Uh, the desert, uh, you can, a death in the desert, or you can live in the promised land. So the division is there. Exodus describes two phases of God's redemption, the old covenant and the new, the covenant of the law and the covenant of blood. And there's so much more I could get in just on talking about the number two in the book of Exodus that we could be here for hours. But let's move on to point number three. Look at the people. Look at the people. God's prerogative to save. There are four main characters involved in this study. Number one, you have the Hebrews. The Hebrews are the Israelites or the Jews. They're all the same people. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 because Joseph was already there. So you have the Israelites. As we learn, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, <coughs> sold into slavery, wound up in Egypt. But God had a reason for these events in Joseph's life because he would blessed Joseph with great leadership skills. It wasn't long until Joseph worked his way up from a slave of a servant to the Pharaoh to become administrator of the whole nation of Egypt. In fact, he was in charge of producing enough grain and enough food supplies, not only to feed Egypt, but Israel in the case of a famine. Seven years, I think, he had to provide enough food. Severe famine came upon the land of Israel, and Joseph's family was forced to go to Egypt to search for food. So after a time of reconciliation, by the way, God caused that famine in order for this to happen. After a time of reconciliation, Jacob and his 11 sons came to live in Egypt as a servants under Joseph. Some 400 years later, by the time of their exodus out of Egypt, there were almost 3 million Hebrews. So they took God's command, be fruitful to multiply. That's the one commandment that they obeyed. To have 3 million people in less than 400 years, that's, uh, that's a lot of birth rate. By the way, that's about the size of the population of greater Atlanta. God had arranged for the Hebrews to go to Egypt for those many years to prepare them to take the land of promise that he was going to provide for them by removing the Canaanites. He was training them to trust God and obey. And how did they do that? They did it by the, in the slave pits of Egypt. Here we see one of the principles of God's method of leadership training. And I, I pray the young folks will perk up here because if a person wants to be used of God, God must physically separate that person from everything and everyone that they once depended upon so they will learn to trust totally in God the Father. And I know Linda is grunting over there because she remembers this lesson. We thought we had it made in the shape of the glass of lemonade. I'm telling you when we first left to go to the school. In less than a year, God had taken every prop away from us. Why? Because we, we were dependent upon the props. Maybe a little finances here, maybe it helped there, but a check or two coming in the mail here. And we had, no, 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 that, all that stopped. stopped. Why? Because we had to learn to trust God. There are two lessons you'll learn when you go to a Bible college or seminary. You'll learn the academic studies, but primarily you'll learn to trust God. And if you don't learn that, what you learned academic, it won't make a whole lot of difference anyway. So every great leader has, that God has used in a mighty way has to go through this time of separation as a part of their preparation in learning to obey. Just obey, 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 obey. So there's no other way. We can see it in the life, I don't have time to get into all this, but we can see it in the life of Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Daniel, Paul, even those in the early church, men whose writings today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul, Peter, 
All of them, their, their writings continue to influence our lives today, 2,000 years later. They all paid the price, listen to me, they all paid the price of solitude and separation. Solitude and separation. One more time. Solitude and, and separation. They had to have that extensive time alone with God. God had to separate them from their world so they could see the world from his perspective and learn to trust him and him alone. Looking back on that today, Linda and I can only wonder what would have happened in our lives had we not obeyed God by taking that first step of faith, not knowing where we were going and why. Oh, we knew where we were going on that first step. My brother had already made the provisions for us. He found the house for us to rent about 15 miles from the school. He found me a job on a radio station that I could work part-time. Okay, so we loaded up. Boy, we were happy as we could be. We were just jolting down the road, ready to launch out. All of a sudden, we pulled in there. My brother had looked like seven days' rain. He said, that house that I rented is gone. Somebody rented it out from under me. And that job on that radio station is only on Sunday. Well, I know where I'm not going to live. I know where I'm not going to work. So we spent the next three days trying to find a place to live and work. So you, you can't predetermine what you're going to do. God says, no, you either trust me now or you'll never trust me. And we had to trust in them. Even though we thought that first step would be our hardest, it wasn't. We faced even harder steps as the decisions and opportunities arose. And we're still facing those hard decisions. But if we, haven't, if we hadn't taken that first step, uh, we would never have known the joy that's in our heart today, having walked in obedience to his call for these 49 years, not the least of which is our precious time with you. And we're so excited to see folks coming now on, on the Sunday night and Wednesday night, because I have so much, so much that I want to share with you. But um, I, I know that I can only share with those who really want to hear it. But maybe God will open up some of the way to get that done. So in his sovereignty, God chose the Hebrews as the people through whom he would reveal himself, his character, his power, his mercy, his grace, his blessing, his loving discipline to the rest of the world. So Exodus 19, 6, God said, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, if you look over in Peter, Peter said, God has called us to be the same thing. He's called us to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 and 8, Moses said, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep his oath which had sworn to your ancestors, beginning with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Judah, God had promised them a special land. It was theirs for the taking because God would, give it to, God would give them the victory, but it was not theirs just for the asking, because they had to remove the Canaanites who were living on it. Now, it was theirs for the taking, but not just for the asking. You, yes, you can ask God for this, but you better put some shoe leather to those prayers if you want them answered. Again, in his sovereignty, <clears throat> and according <clears throat> to his divine plan, God chose to remove the Canaanites from the land he was given to the Hebrews, but he knew they were not physically or spiritually able to fight the Canaanites. Remember, they sent some spies over, and they came back and said, man, those people are giants compared to us. We, we, looked at, we look like grasshoppers compared to them. Remember this? And so God knew they were not physically ready to take on the Canaanites. So God created a need for them to go to Egypt to be worked and worked hard to build up their muscles, to build up their strength, to build up their unity, to create with them a desire to be in their own land, so that in his time he would deliver them from Egypt and hopefully to the promised land. That's the people called the Hebrews. Now, what about Pharaoh? Okay, Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. When Joseph arrived in Egypt as a slave boy, because of his attitude of submission he quickly rose to a position of influence because the king of Egypt saw God's hand was upon him. Now, now stop there just for a moment. The king of Egypt saw God's hand upon this boy. What does that mean about the king of Egypt? That meant that he had some inkling that there was the God of the, about the God of the Hebrews. And even though the king did not embrace Joseph's God, God moved in the heart of that king to accomplish his divine purpose. Now remember, he came as a slave. He was tested a couple of times, as we know, and threatened and put into jail. There's an example here of how we're to witness to our non-Christian employers and our non-Christian co-workers. 
When famine spread across the land, Joseph's family had to seek aid from the leaders of Egypt, not knowing that it was where Joseph was. His brothers, uh, Joseph's brothers didn't know where he was. Now think about that for a moment. Had Joseph not been sold as a slave by his brothers, and had Joseph not submitted himself as a slave unto his masters, even though they were unbelievers, Joseph would not have earned the trust of the king of Egypt, and he would not have been in the position to help his father's family and brothers in their time of need. So God may send us into a situation that we say, why in the world are you sending me here? What are you, what are you doing? Don't question that. Because God knows exactly how to get, he knows how to get to point D, but going by A, B, and C first. We want to go to D. But God says, no, you got to go here, and you got to go there, and you got to go here, and you got to go there in order to get what I'm trying to train you. And it's, it's like this. Whatever your hands find to do, somebody finish that verse. Whatever your hands find to do, do it as unto the Lord, right? So if you get hired as a dishwasher in a restaurant, you need to have the cleanest dishes anybody's ever seen. You need to do the best job that anybody has ever worked there. Why? Because the, because the nature of the Lord is at, the glory of the Lord is at stake. And if you will do that job, then guess what? He may come and give you the broom the next week while you could, I saw you do, wash dishes. Now what can you do with the broom? And then the broom, you go up to the next stage. Uh, we need to teach our young people that, that when, you, when somebody gives you a job, you do it to the best of your ability in order that you might get promoted. I know folks, they want the big jobs. They want the big stores and whatever. Okay, then start out as a bag boy. Start out as a bag boy. Yeah, I kid a little kid who is working. I'm not kidding him. I'm really just playing around with him. But he's been uh, one of the people at the, at the window of McDonald's. And I said, you know, you keep working like you're working. You're going to own this place. Well, guess what? About two weeks ago, he got promoted to staff manager. And he said, guess what? I got a promotion. And I said, how did you get that? He said, well, I don't know. I said, I know. You've been here every morning, and you're doing a good job. You, you're doing a hard job. And you did your job well. And they saw that, and they promoted you. Well, let me get on with this. Had Joseph not earned the trust of the king, Jacob and his family would have been turned away, or perhaps even killed. Again, Satan's attempt to destroy the seed. Remember, the seed is the key issue here. But because of Joseph's submission, and because of Joseph's willingness to work, the king gave Joseph the best of the land for his family to raise their sheep and establish their community. And down here in this beautiful land, how many people? Three million people were raised on that land. That's why in Genesis 50, 20, Joseph said, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Okay, when we're out there and your brother said, we're going to get rid of our little brother here, and we're going to sell him to a bunch of slave owners, they're going to take him to Egypt and, him, and sell him to Pharaoh. They thought you did all that for evil, but there was a holy God who meant it for good. And it's because you did that that I'm now able to come back to you and say, come on, we're going to provide, family for my, provide food for my family. Chapter 1, verse 8, where Moses wrote, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Uh-oh, we've got a problem here. This new Pharaoh not only did not know God, he, didn't even, he even denied the existence of God. Therefore, he had no respect for those who believed in God, and that included Joseph and his kinfolk. And because he did not know God or trust God, his heart was filled with fear when he saw the Israelites outnumbered the Egyptians. And here's, here's part of Satan's work. A paraphrase of Exodus chapter 1, verse 10 through 22 tells a story. Let me read it as a paraphrase. And here's what the king, we must find a way to put an end to this. If we don't and war breaks out, they'll join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. In other words, we'll lose them as our slaves. If they, if they, if they rise up against us, then they'll join with our enemies and we'll lose them their slave labor. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves and put slave masters over them, hoping to wear them down under the heavy burden so they would not be able to reproduce. They forced them to build the cities of Python and Ramesses and supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, in the, uh, the more quickly the Israelites multiplied. <laughs> the Egyptians decided to increase the labor by forcing them to make bricks and mortar and work long hours in the fields. They even ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill the male babies, but the Israelites' women found out about this and just had their babies at home by themselves. Then Pharaoh gave the order that all, that all male babies should be thrown into the Nile River. 
Now, having heard what you've heard tonight, what was God doing? God was preparing these people. He was building up their muscles, building up their strength, building up their desire to get out of Egypt and to go to the land that belonged to them. He was creating within them the desire to get out of where they were and go to the place he wanted them to go. Have, has, there, has God ever used that in your life? You get so dissatisfied where you are, it ain't working here, something's wrong, so I have a greater desire to go to someplace else. And so God is using that, that problem, that heartache, that, that, that slavery, if you will, to motivate you to get on with it. The king of Egypt had absolute control over every person and everything in Egypt. He was worshipped as a god by the people. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan, the god of this world, as we said this morning, who exerts his power to control, to abuse, to threaten, to persecute, and if that doesn't work, to murder Christians as he has done since he motivated Cain to kill Abel. And by the way, they're still putting Christians in churches and burning them, sitting on fire tonight. Uh, I wrote a little note to one of my Baptist friends recently. I said, it's amazing to me when somebody leads 25 people to the Lord, that makes headlines, but I've never seen a story in the paper about how many Christians are martyred today. We get all hot, we get all excited about somebody coming to know Christ, but what about those who are giving their life for Christ today? You never hear about it on anybody's news. So just as the Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh, every believer is a slave to Satan and to his evil ways. All they think they're free to do as they please, but they're really hooked in slavery. And just as Pharaoh tried to keep the Israelites from leaving Egypt and obeying God, Satan tries to everything he can in his power to keep people from leaving the system of the world and following their God. Oh, you don't want to do that. You'll be the outcast of the world. Well, I would rather be the outcast of the world to be at one with God. And by the way, it may require that. Think about your own life. Can you see the way that Satan is holding you back from becoming the truly devoted disciple of Christ that's called you to be? Are you any closer to the Lord today than you were yesterday? How about last week or last year? Or how about the day that you said you were born again? Are you closer to the Lord right now than you were then? If not, why not? Whose fault is that? What has Satan put in your pathway to keep you from that pursuit of God? Worldly things, your career, your family, your hobbies. Satan doesn't mind us being religious. Satan doesn't mind us having a cool faith and a cool Christ to keep us out of a hot hell. But the moment we begin to live in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan gets angry, he gets mad, and he gets mean because our devotion to Christ is a reminder of his coming doom. Every time we, we say no to the Satan and yes to Christ, it reminds him of what's coming right down the line. Look at Moses, and we'll try to hurry here. Moses is a picture of Christ. God chose Moses to serve as the deliverer of his people, and therefore Moses is a type of Christ. Moses was a Hebrew by birth, but he was raised in an Egyptian culture. As a child, as you know, he was supposed to have been killed under Pharaoh's orders, just as baby Jesus was supposed to have been killed under Herod's orders. But rather than kill him, Moses, the mother, uh, Moses' mother put him in a small ark made of reeds and tar, like the ark was made of wood and pitch or tar, and then he, they just sort of put him in the Nile River. No, again, no way of navigating that, no way of determining where it was going to go. She trusted God with her child. And uh, guess what happened? Only God could have arranged this. Why? Because the baby boy was discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. And then again, by God's sovereignty, his own mother was enlisted to nurse him and train him. So unbeknownst to Pharaoh and to even Pharaoh's daughter, Moses was being raised by his own mom, and he should have been in the Nile River and allowed to die. So in the second chapter of Exodus, when Moses was 40 years old, he saw an Israelite man being abused by an Egyptian, and Moses killed the Egyptian. Now, this is one of those things where an earthly vision, you try to, it's, it's an earthly vision of a heavenly calling. In other words, God has called you to deliver your people from bondage, but he didn't say go kill them. And that's where Moses made a mistake. Uh, without the spiritual maturity to know what to do and what not to do, Moses acted upon his own, and he had to be sent to the backside of the desert for 40 years uh, to pay for that particular problem. So in the threat of his life, Moses fled to Midian, the very backside of the desert, 
where God taught him the same principles of dependence that was, he was teaching the Israelites in Egypt. So God is preparing their deliverer in the backside of the desert. He's preparing his people in the Egypt. Living in the desert for 40 years, Moses learned that every day of his life was a gift from God. I hope you are now seeing that, that behind the Hebrews and behind Pharaoh uh, and behind Moses is our next person, God the Father. God is still in charge of it, but you can see all the things he's doing. Now, it's, it's easy for us to see that 2020 hi hindsight, but going forward, they didn't see how all this was going to come to, come about. As I said in the beginning, these historical events happen. They're part of a recorded history, not only in the Bible, but as of right now, they're still in the world history books. But when the world, what the world doesn't see, lest they see and believe, is that a loving and powerful God was behind it all, working all things together for his purpose, the main one being to illustrate his plan for our redemption. God called out a people for himself, the Hebrews, to serve as a channel through which the seed of the Savior would be born and passed. God allows him to be taken to, to uh, uh, captivity by Pharaoh, the very picture of Satan, who tries every trick he knows to destroy the seed. But God sends Moses, the picture of the Savior, to free them from their bondage and their slavery and to deliver them into the closest fellowship with God that any people on earth have ever experienced. There's no other, no other people. God has not revealed himself to any other nation of people like he did to the people in Moses' day. Even the casual reading of the book of Exodus will convince even the most skeptical person of us that God is there and he does care that he will provide a way when there seems to be no other way. He will move heaven and earth to bring about his purposes, especially in the lives of those who learn to trust him and obey him. Look, how, how, do, you, how do you get this same cloud that covers, covers there from the sun every day? How do you get this cloud of fire that keeps him warm at night? How do you get this manna from heaven? How do you get this water out of a rock? Has God done that in, to any other nation of people? Absolutely not. So he was proving himself faithful. Number three, the pictures. The person of the Savior. The deliverance of Israel from Egyptian slavery is a perfect picture of our redemption from the bondage of sin. Let me quickly draw the parallels here. Israel was in Egypt because of their disobedience to God's will. Egypt symbolizes the world, and Paul said before we were saved, we walked according to the course of this world, the systems of the world, as we talked about this morning. Israel's bondage to the king describes the dominion sin had over us before we were saved. We were in bondage to sin. We were slaves to sin. Egypt is always a picture of evil and wickedness. And we were in bondage to that evil. We were in bondage to that wickedness. The groaning of the Hebrews for freedom describes the longing in the heart of those who are lost and without salvation through Christ and trying to get free from sin's bondage. Pharaoh's desire to destroy the people of God shows us Satan's desire to destroy those who believe in Jesus Christ. Now, he may not be doing that on the, on, in American soul, but he's doing it on foreign soul, even as I'm speaking tonight. I just read this afternoon. It is now illegal to preach a sermon of the gospel in China without having it approved by the government. Now, that doesn't mean the preacher's going to do it. But if they find you preaching a sermon without have it having been approved, they're going to tear your building down. And they showed a picture of them tearing a great, magnificent building down. Now, we don't hear about that. We don't, that's the reason I said, turn the stupid thing off. Find some other way to get your information, because you're not getting the full story. And certainly you're not getting about Christians. Not even from Christian media are you getting the stories about the persecution. So Pharaoh's desire to destroy the people of God shows us Satan's desire to destroy us. Moses was raised up by God as a deliverer, just as Jesus was raised up for our salvation. This being the only one, this is just one of 75 pictures of Christ in the book of Exodus. When I first preached this sermon, this series of sermons, what, 1990s or something like that? Or was it 1990s? People said, are you ever going to get out of Exodus? I thought Exodus was a book on the way out. Will you ever get out of the book of Exodus? I kept finding spots of the Lamb. There's 75 pictures of Christ in the book of Exodus alone. The crossing of the Red Sea is a picture of our baptism. The journey through the wilderness, a picture of dying to self. How about the giving of the law? That's our discipleship. How about the tabernacle? That's our personal worship, our call to worship. 
How about the Passover night? Shows us our security under the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. For as those Hebrews walked out of Egyptian bondage, having been saved by the blood of the Lamb, we who've been set free to walk in the newness of life, having been saved by the blood of the precious Lamb of God. There's a beautiful parallel there. And all this in the second book of Moses, the book of Exodus, which shows us lost, shows lost man the way out of his slavery to sin. I wonder if you've ever pictured yourself in these events. Are you still in bondage to the world? Are you still a slave to the sins and the systems of the world? Now be careful how you answer that. I know in your heart of hearts you want to say, I'm no longer enslaved by the systems of this world. Well, be careful with that. Why? Because so much of the world has been adopted by the church that the difference is no longer obvious. You think about it, and I'm not going to get into the particular details tonight, but you just think about that, how much of the world we have now allowed in the church, and that's why we're making no difference in the world. My friend, the Deliverer has come, and um, some 3,000, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He has provided the way out for those who will believe in him and follow him. He's come for you, but now you must come to him. You must have the faith to take that first step of faith and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Let's close tonight with this prayer. Heavenly Father, again I pray that the Holy Spirit has come, and, and I pray that he's been the tutor, the teacher, the instructor, uh, the interpreter of truth tonight for those precious people who have gathered here in this room and for those who may be gathered with us online even tonight or those who will listen to the sermon at some other time later. Lord, your word is true. Your word is always true. And we pray, Father, tonight that the truth of the word of God will set us free from anything that would rob us of the joy that Jesus has died to give to us. May we go back and study the book of Exodus now with a little different purpose in our life to see the picture of our own redemption and how you're still working things out until the day you come and redeem us from this world, no longer under the power of sin or the penalty of sin, but even the very presence of sin. Oh, we look forward to that day. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. God bless you. Bring somebody with you next week. Say hello to our guests and visit.